Hello, I'm Lexington Times web editor, Paul Oliva. I'm here with Councilman David Kloiber. He's agreed to join us to speak about gun violence today. Uh, Mr. Kloiber, starting off, um, how long have you been on the council? And this what do my, you do day to day? Sorry, this is my first term on council. And day to day, I wear a couple of hats. I have an investment company where I help invest in small companies, grow them, build them up across the country. And I also run a nonprofit here locally in town that tries to get better education and technology in our schools and safe places for kids. Is your name on the YMCA building somewhere? <laughs> we have partnered with the uh, YMCA a lot. And at the Whitaker YMCA, we helped to build a pavilion that allowed them to do summer programs outside in their field. So it's a nice shady space with bathroom facilities so that kids can have summer instructional programs out there at the YMCA. Huh. I, I used to live out there and I took my kids swimming there. I, I really like that YMCA. Um, I'm a huge fan, supporter, and member. So, no, oh, oh, nice. Maybe I saw you and didn't even know it. Um, next question. What does the mayor do exactly in Lexington? And if the council passes a law, are they able to veto it? So yes, a mayor has veto powers, but more generally, the mayor has a few responsibilities. The first is as a representative for the city. So they are there to represent um, issues for the city at the state level, at the county level, to other municipalities. The second is the administration. They are there to administer the laws that are, are made by the council. And that includes, you know, giving direction to our police. It includes making sure that the trash is picked up on time. Um, you know, all of the basic functions of our city. So um, that kind of encompasses the, the general idea of what the mayor here in our city does. Most of our power is vested in the council who is making all of the ordinances and setting the, uh, the final budget for the city. Okay, um, thank you. I, I, I guess uh, a lot of people don't really um, know about a lot of the day-to-day -day duties of, of local elected officials. How can they find out more um, if they wanna receive more information about that? So uh, the first thing would be to, I would say, reach out and ask any elected official. They'd be happy to tell you. Um, before I got into office, it was also very difficult for me to understand, you know, what the day to day was going to be. Uh, I will say that it varies based off the involvement of each specific individual. But generally speaking, there's a lot to get done. And it gets compounded even more when you uh, go out into the community to make sure you're, you're representing people the way they, they hope you are. Okay, very good. Um, so we, we do have, uh, I know there's federal, state, and local government, and I know the Bill of Rights uh, kind of restricts what the federal government can, can do, and the Commonwealth Constitution, uh, that restricts the state government. Do any restrictions exist on the local level here in Lexington? So the only powers that we have at the local level are given to us by the state. And we have a specific KRS statute that dictates exactly what Lexington as a merged county, urban county government can do. So our powers are explicitly given to us and laid out in our charter and the doctrine of the KRS from the state. Okay, um, so what about like taxes? Does that restrict how much you guys can tax? Yes, uh, we have very strict rules about that and about what taxes actually come to the city. Uh, a good example of that is property tax. Uh, out of all of the property tax, it's only three cents out of every um, hundred thousand dollar assessment of tax that comes to the city. Most of it goes to the state. Some of it goes to the library, but we actually do not make that revenue here in the city. Our primary source of revenue is off of something called occupational licensing or an income tax, which is currently sitting at 2.25%. So uh, we are only allowed to do those things because the state has given us that power. We don't have the power to create new taxes unilaterally. There are a couple of processes that we can um, ask for a referendum to add extra taxes. You've seen it with Lextran when they added that but the power to ask for that was given to us by the state. So we do not have local option taxing available here in Lexington. Okay, so that 2.5%, that I guess that's like when I get my paycheck, 
that's what's taken out of for the local tax. Uh, how how much do you guys bring in that way every year? So that's well, let's not overtax us. It's two point two five right now. Um, they, they lowered it a, a little while back, um, but uh, I think that that revenue accounts for about sixty to seventy percent of all revenue for the city. Okay. So. If we look at the budget for last year at about 420 million, as far as revenue brought in, the majority of that money was brought in by the occupational licensing tax or people working here in the city. Okay, um, very informative. Where can to put it in comparison, I think about it was about $20 million total was brought in from property tax. Okay, okay, that, that's, uh, that's noteworthy. Uh, where can people go to learn more about the budget? Because I um, I did have trouble initially uh, Googling around to find what the budget was for Bay County. So we do have, um, you can always go to the website, the city's website, um, lexingtonky.gov, and go see the, um, the public documents that are put out through Granicus and Legistar. And those are going to have all the documents in the forms that they were passed. So you can find the budget and go through it, but that's often you know, a slog to go through those hundreds and hundreds of pages of spreadsheets. If you're, if you're wanting more information, the finance department has a wonderful um, department of revenue that is happy to talk you through even specific issues that matter to you. In a lot of these cases, it's difficult to find the information in an easily digestible manner online. But if you call in and talk to somebody, people are usually more than happy to help get that understanding across because you know we're all doing everything in the in the public eye. Okay. Uh, last softball. Mm -hmm. If you were a character on the popular HBO show The Wire, who would you be? If I was a character on the um, popular HBO show The Wire. Now, I love The Wire. I feel that their characters are generally um, intentionally human and flawed. Um, I, are you human and flawed, David? I, I, I am. And so I'm trying to see okay. which one I relate to the most. Um, wow, that is a good question. Um, I feel I, like there is one obvious answer. What, what obvious what obvious answer is that um, uh, Carsetti or um, yes some some of us have joked that 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 might be what you would have said to the question but I'll let you give your own response no 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 that, I mean I, I get it um, I honestly not having grown up in that lifestyle um, I haven't really related to any of them directly I, I love the characters I think that they are colorful and, and interesting um, I just I never had a desire to be in politics. So I, it's hard for me to relate to, you know, the political characters, um, maybe the school teacher. And I can't remember his name because I, at one point in time, I was. Pres I was Pres Belusky. Yeah. Are, are you referring to Pres Belusky? Pres Belusky. Yeah, okay. that's absolutely. Yeah. I like he the former, well, the former cop who was then the teacher in his teacher phase, not so much in the pulling out his gun and causing issues phase. Um, yeah. Just because. I spend so much of my time trying to work with kids and trying to make sure that they all have a better and more equal experience. So. Okay. Um, thank you. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a good response. Let me, um, i going to open up the screen share. Just give me a moment, please. Uh, can you see this? Yes. All right. Very good. So. Um, Nick recently tweeted this, uh, this Nick has a lot of followers, um, because of this moment. So he, um, on Sunday, tweeted this to all of his followers, Lexington and Beliefs. What are you all doing to prevent, to try and prevent this? It seems like there's a shooting downtown every other weekend. People don't feel safe being town town on the weekends right now. So my question for you, David, is with UK and Transy students returning soon, is it safe to go downtown on the weekends right now? So 
generally, I would say that our city is is less safe today than it has been in the past. And downtown is definitely an area that's been affected. We've had people walking out of wedding receptions at the Marriott who've gotten, you know, jumped and beaten until they were in the hospital needing brain surgery. We've had uh, several shootings in the parking garages down here between, you know, where I walk to my office building and where I park my car. So um, I can understand the, uh, the issues and trepidation there. I know for a fact that the downtown Lexington Management District, which is a, a district that tries to make sure that we keep up a, um, you know, make sure we keep some of the areas of downtown clean and make sure we keep it safe has helped to hire a few more sheriffs and patrolmen to try and help with the situation. But the issues are much bigger than that. And it's not going to be safe for downtown until it's safer everywhere. And that's going to take a kind of a multi pronged approach. Uh, what would you, uh, what, what's the approach the mayor's currently using and what would your approach be? How would it differ? So the mayor has stated several times that she wants to create a brand new solution to deal with the violence in our city. I am much more of a data-driven individual. I want to use the best uh, proven policies from across the country. So currently there is a program that is promoted by the National Network of Safe Cities. It's GVI. It was originally started in Boston. It's been used in Baltimore, Chicago, Seattle, San Francisco, Cincinnati. It's just being implemented in Louisville and was recommended to Lexington by a study done by us independently in 2019. It is a program which brings true community policing in whatever way works best for your city. It's completely tailored for you. And it's been shown to reduce gun violence by up to 60% in the first two years of implementation. So personally, I believe very strongly we need to use these data-driven methods instead of trying to reinvent the wheel here in Lexington. Well, so what's what are the methods you're describing? I know the name of the program. I don't know what it is, though. Okay, so the general premise is that it stems from this. People living in communities know where the bad actors are, but they don't feel safe or safe enough to work with our officers in removing those bad actors. GVI creates that trust. It puts officers and community leaders together, empowering community leaders with a moral authority to help remove these actors from their neighborhoods so that we can together you know, address the root of the issue, which is these people who are conducting their businesses, who are trafficking in our human misery, and get them and remove them from those communities that are actively asking us to do that. So it's a lot about putting officers um, in neighborhoods, walking through neighborhoods, making sure that we have um, buy-in from communities and they feel empowered in order to help protect themselves. Okay, um, I'm going to move on now. Uh, another yeah. screen share coming for you. This uh, was top post on Reddit, our Lexington on Sunday. Last night at 2.30 at the pavilion, someone opened fire to a group of people towards the courthouse. Then they took off towards Elixir Bar past it. Cops and stuff didn't leave until around 3.20. No one's made any post, which is kind of crazy considering it was multiple rounds in a very crowded pavilion, then more shots past Elixir. We were in E when it happened, and the security saw him draw from across the street and shoved everyone in and back. A scary situation that no one is addressing is really messing with me. Those Why? kind of stories, you, I mean, that is, I mean, unfortunately, those stories are becoming more and more common. Um, the the amount of, of violence that we're seeing spill over um, downtown, but not just downtown, uh, I know that <laughs> this one struck out to me on, on the what primary election, spillover. I'm sorry. What's that? You said violence. Uh, you've seen violence spill over into downtown for yes. spillover from where? So through the history of our city, there have been um, areas near the interstate 
and specifically on the north side of town that have often been plagued with increased violence. And while that's not acceptable, um, people had felt like, well, it's in this area of town. Well, we're seeing more and more over the last five years that it's no longer being, you know, just limited to that part of town. We're seeing it in downtown. We're seeing groups um, going through cars in every single suburb throughout the city. I think there was about um, 130 to 160 guns stolen from cars just in the first six months of this year um, in Lexington that were reported. So we're having more and more of this crime just moving throughout our city. Downtown is a huge focus because we've been spending so much of our resources trying to revitalize it. And so it's becoming even more noticeable as it it, it uh, takes place in that area. Okay. Um, so I want to have, I want to show you one more thing. Mm -hmm. Let's see. All right. So another Reddit user, uh, they use language that I don't feel comfortable using personally myself uh, to describe the situation, but they um, basically said when violence occurs in Lexington's disadvantaged neighborhoods, the authorities care less. Here's a map of 2020 shootings. Um, I believe there's been 71 total incidents, two mass shootings and 87 people, total people shot. Uh, here's the, the breakdown of where they all occurred. What do you see and how would you uh, address uh, this Reddit user's concerns? Well, there, it seems that their concern is about the response um, and that we're giving different services to different people in our communities. And that just shouldn't be the case. Uh, I, I believe that, again, there are a lot of factors that are going into why this is happening. But this isn't a situation where, you know, I can relate it again back to schools, right? You don't only want to just give all of our resources to schools that are performing the least. You want to make sure that you are doing whatever is needed in, in those schools to help the most, which isn't necessarily just a ratio amount. So, so what we're really looking for is, is equity of service, which some of it comes into, well, frequency and trying to reduce that, but what you're gonna do to reduce the frequency there and what you're gonna do other places isn't always the same. So um, we need to do a lot here. Our current methods for trying to reduce this violence are just not working. We have seen, I believe it is five new records for homicides set over the last seven years. Wow. At a time um, over the last 10 years where homicides have been on the decline nationally in Lexington, they've been rising. In fact, this year, the New York Times just put out um, a, a study that they, they completed that showed that nationally homicides are down in cities by 3%. Whereas here in Lexington, we're on pace to hit another record. Mm. Um, it's just, we're being told that things are getting better, but we're not actually seeing it played out in any meaningful way. So uh, I just, again, it's something that has been acknowledged for many years that this is an issue that needs to be addressed. We just haven't been going at it the way that was recommended to us, which was bringing in these proven programs and getting our community involved. And if that means changing the way that our public safety looks to be more community oriented, making sure that we have uh, social service workers and the paramedicine group and police all working together in order to provide the services our community wants, well, then that's where we need to go. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, moving on from gun violence now, uh, this, uh, I'd say this has to do with more of a public accountability uh, topic. I'm gonna share one more thing for you. Okay, um, so I pulled some tax information linked to uh, possibly yourself and the mayor. I. Don't know 100% sure that this is the mayor's, um, could be completely wrong here. Uh, however, it appears that her property has been assessed at significantly less than uh, similar homes in her area. Um, that's what her 2022 value is. It didn't go up at all. 
uh, from 2021 to 2022. Uh, she bought her, you know, these people who are Linda and Charles Gordon, who I am kind of jumping to a conclusion that it's the mayor's family, uh, acquired this home in 1983. And then um, you go back and look at their history. Um, 2002, it was at 250, went up to 255. 2009, 280, finally in 2015, went up about 70 grand to 352. Um, they also enjoy a homestead exemption of 40,005. So one thing I'm gonna, I'll look at real quick on this is, um, and if you if you look at that chart, you, um, these properties in general throughout the city are supposed to be assessed once every four years. So it's very common to see no changes between one year. But if you look at where the biggest change, what do you say it was? 2015 is where there was a change. And that would mean that her house should be on a cycle of being assessed in 2015 and then in 2019 and then again in 2023. So, okay. so it, and it looks like the chart doesn't go up to 2019 there or does it? Yeah. Um, oh, it looks like. But that would be the current, the current value. So, so, so the PVA, basically splits our city into quadrants and then goes through. And when I say quadrants, I just mean they split up one fourth of the assessments. It's not actual quadrants of the city. So you'll see those assessments go up once every four years if they're being, um, if, if they don't get missed or slipped or, or if they're done properly. So you, we would expect that her value of her house, that this disparity right here of 362 to 403 is the highest disparity because she's one year away from being reassessed. Well, it, isn't it the, because oh, of the, the homestead, homestead yeah, yeah, the homestead. Yeah. I'm just but talking about the, versus the comparable part. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So it should be her, her property should be assessed in the next year. And, and based off those, if her fare is 403 and nearby is, you know, somewhere between 440 and 490, kind of in that average there um, with the others possibly being outliers, don't know, but uh, we would, you'd probably expect there to be a pretty hefty increase because values have gone way up. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. That makes sense. Uh, let's check yours out then. Uh, I don't know um, if this is your property management company, but this uh, was linked to you. Uh, you know, it was linked to your property management company. I'm assuming this is your property mm -hmm. management company. Um, 429, uh, fair cash value and taxable valuable, uh, taxable value 2020. Um, not way far off uh, from the values of similar homes uh, acquired in 2012. Um, so if we were in 12, then it would be assessed then, and then again in 16, and again in 20. So we'll be up in 24 for a reassessment. So I should be halfway through you know, that kind of um, cycle, which will show, it, that looks about right though, if you look at it, we've had a, a pretty big spike in the last two years that hasn't been accounted for that, that the property would be assessed at in another two years. Okay. Cool. Cool. But um, all these, th these are things that are not easily or readily um, made, made, you know, public. It's not easy to just go through and say, Hey, where am I on the cycle? And when's the PBA going to assess my property? Um, it's something you have to like call the office and that is a state office. So again, it's just a matter of, of trying to figure out where you're at and, and things of that nature. So so is, is he a state elected official then or a county? So it is a state office. Um, so yeah, they, that is, it is mandated by the constitution. And so he is, it's a state office that's elected. Yeah. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, well, uh, I think we're going to wrap it up. I'll, I'll give you the final word here, uh, Mr. Clover. I really appreciate you uh, coming on and, and speaking with the voters today. Well, thank you for the opportunity our city, our city needs some change. The things we're doing specifically surrounding gun violence are not working. I can't claim to have all the answers, but I want to use proven methods in order to address it. I think that's, that pretty much sums up my stance on how we should move forward on this. And I hope that it, together we can get the support we need in order to make some real change and make our city a lot safer for our kids. All right.
Uh, you can stick around for uh, a moment. I'm going to stop recording. Um...